Kia ora koutou. E kia ngā kou ana ahau ki te te aki taiau ki te honga tapu tapu awaha. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you, Claire, for that um, uh, introduction and exposing how old I am. Um, and um, thank you also to Dave and Claire for pulling this together um, with the um, um, ANZA um, first meeting, which is fantastic. Uh, Aquaculture New Zealand recognising how important um, seaweed are. And um, also the support of Cawthron and Sustainable Seas. It's a, it's a real honour today to be able to speak to this um, hui with, um, on the release of this report, which helps to set that framework and plan that we need. The, um, and Rob, you did a great job um, summarising that and um, uh, for that official release. Before I get into my talk about high, a high value product, um, I want to just um, talk about some of the flavours I've picked up. <laughs> and um, you did a great job, Dale, without um, having your slides in front of you. I think today well, there's a lot of energy in the room and that's fantastic. And um, it, it feels really good that we've got this opportunity in front of us. Um, there's, it does feel to me there's two main themes. One is that um, it does feel like the aquaculture industry maybe 30 years ago, and that's awesome. Um, and it also feels like the, um, the crash of the um, microalgal biofuels field about 15 years ago. And I think we can balance those things up because now no one will touch renewable energy sources from algae, micro, macro, and yet they still have a place to play. And so we've got to be careful about managing hype. Um, but there's lots of real things we can do. And today um, I'm going to be talking about a high value product. And the aim of that is to, to, to describe how potentially high value products can enable an industry. And so hopefully Rimu Rimi will be part of the third pillar of um, aquaculture in New Zealand. So this project is a two year uh, sustainable seas blue economy innovation fund project and I'm very grateful for support from that. And it was co-developed by my industry partners, SRW Labs and Wakatu Incorporation. And it's about looking at sun care products from algae. Algae, reds, greens, browns, of course, but actually in this project and for my bigger picture, it includes microalgae and cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are not algae, um, technically, but functionally, uh, they have many of the similar properties and are actually quite useful in an industrial or commercial environment. Essentially, everything photosynthetic and wet I'm interested in. On the um, x-axis here, we've got scale of production, and on the y-axis, we've got um, value of those products. We've been in this um, space here with animal feed, aquaculture feed, and food products for some time. And they're, they're, they're relatively high value, um, but they're, they're towards the lower end of the scale. There's so many other products, and we've heard this message come through a few times today, that there's, um, it can get a bit messy. But we've got to explore all of these things. And one of my aims today is to talk about higher value products as a way to get started, get traction, make progress, make the mistakes, um, and, and work out how to move forward so that we can get down to some of these larger scale benefits, including ecosystem services and bioremediation, um, and contribution for things like renewable energy products where they make sense, not where they are trying to be pushed as um, magic bullets, because there's no magic bullets. This particular project looks at pigments, and um, pigments in many uh, seaweed microalgae and cyanobacteria actually are multifunctional. We, we refer to them in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the field as um, uh, true secondary metabolites where they have multiple functions. Algae, of course, are the masters of managing light. And so part of what that is is channeling, channeling that light energy, but then also handling side reactions. And that's what a lot of these pigments do. Some of these pigments are involved in the light harvesting complexes of algae, uh, but then they're also involved in managing um, harmful, potentially harmful redox side products, uh, um, pathways. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about sunscreen technology, and I'll just whiz through this so we don't spend too much time. But basically, the market's quite big, um, but skin cancer is still on the rise. And there's two main approaches to um, sun blocking, and that's literally blocking molecules. These are the zincs and the titaniums. They literally reflect the light away. And absorbers. And these absorbers tend to be organic molecules with complicated long names. Um, and um, they tend to absorb light energy and um, dissipate it in different ways, often through production of longer wavelength light. There's actually about 20 of those in the market. And um, uh, and they've got names like oxybenzone, which we're familiar seeing on some of our products. But um, both these approaches have pro problems. Um, I can't go in, uh, into a lot of depth, but basically the way we've formulated some of those blocking molecules means that we've made the particles smaller. That means that they're actually uh, getting from the surface of our skin into basement membrane basement places in our skin, where perhaps photochemistry is occurring in places where you don't want it to. It also means we're uncertain about the, um, what those nanoparticles are doing in the environment. And some of the um, organic molecules also have some issues around them, human health, aquatic health, some are um, estrogen analogues, uh, there's a variety of things out there. So long story short is, all of the current approaches have some issues that, um, are, are, um, that we need new, new ways forward. There's an, another couple of points that I'd like to bring up, and that's the vitamin D thing. We actually need some UV light in our skin for uh, proper chemistry to car carry on there, vitamin D production, et cetera. So we, we only want to block uh, a fraction of the light and manage that well. The other problem is, is non-obvious. It's, it's the SPF problem. And I've, I've described this before. When I was young, um, decades ago, um, uh, it was SPF 4 was pretty common. And now SPF 30, SPF 50, not uncommon. That two, means two things. One is we're getting exposed to more of these molecules. Two, more of these molecules are washing off into the environment. Natural sunscreens. There are actually a couple of different things that we know about that can potentially be involved in sun care products. Uh, the microsporin A-like amino acids are a class of molecules that are those light harvesting complexes. Um, they're found in red seaweeds and cyanobacteria, and they're, um, they're quite complicated molecules, but seaweed know how to make them quite well, and there are about 20 or 30 of them. The other one is uh, fluorotannins. These are antioxidants that are found in brown seaweeds and the evolutionary related uh, uh, microalgae. Um, and they're actually quite a weak antioxidant. So often um, uh, there's, there's a move towards trying to block things to trying to modulate things. And that's where some of these weaker antioxidants might be beneficial. So in this study, um, we have looked at we're trying to identify native and endemic sources of these, especially in seaweed, but we're also looking at cyanobacteria. And we're looking actually on muscle farms. The reason we're looking on muscle farms is because if these things are growing as biofouling at the moment, they're growing themselves on muscle farming without us trying, well, at least that's a potential way for us to potentially aquaculture them down the line. We're also using the structure of the muscle farms to then also be able to um, understand how these species come and go through seasonal changes and how these molecules within those species come and go without seasonal changes and at depth in the water. This is, this is Greg Smith from Kono Seafood Limited. Um, and um, Greg and um, Dean Higgins, the marine farm managers, yes, Thank you, um, uh, Paul, for this. Um, take us out every three months to go and visit the marine farms in the Marlborough Sounds, and we're doing a seaweed, um, marine farm seaweed biodiversity study to look at these things. And this is one of our sites on uh, Sono, uh, this is at Forsyth Bay in Polaris. And this is some of the team doing some of the work. This is Paul South, um, fantastic ecologist. Uh, Rosella um, Nikolai, who's unfortunately um, left us, but fortunately for her, she's gone on to do a PhD um, on the other side of the planet, and Rita Lee. But there's a bunch of us that have been involved in this work. And we, 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 we've just done our fifth of six um, sampling points. 
And this is the kind of data that we're getting. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of data behind this, um, but this is just a snapshot. And what you can see here is um, uh, composition of MAAs in this case, and they've got molecules like porphyra 334, palathene. Um, we've, we've developed methods for looking at all of them, and we've also got similar charts for fluorotannins. But Dave did warn me not to have too many charts, so um, this is the only one I've got. And then we're comparing that by species abundance and depth and all those things. There's actually a really important third part to this study, which I haven't really got time to go into, but I did want to introduce, and that's about how to completely look at the problem differently. We're, we're collaborating in this project with um, Gary Fisher, who's a molecular dermatologist based at the University of Michigan. And he's had these insights over the years around um, what happens in our skin during the sunburn process, and has shown that it's an immune reaction. But importantly, he's shown that there is a key oxidant sensitive step and we're targeting this. So in this project, the Sustainable Seas project has enabled us to develop a cellular bioassay tool to be able to find out what, this, um, what, the, what the molecules are that can potentially protect that um, from happening. I'm happy to go into more detail um, um, in an outside forum um, describing how this works. The reason this is interesting is because it's not a blocking or a screening technique. It's potentially a way to modulate our skin's reaction to UVR, which might allow UV um, chemistry that needs to go on, like vitamin D production, to occur. And it might also uh, be a paradigm shift in being able to treat sunburn after you've got sunburn. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, we haven't done clinical trials or anything yet, but you need to explore these things. This is a wordy slide, and I won't go into it, but it is important to think about how this particular project fits into the, the blue economy. And we're essentially, um, essentially um, trying to gener generate next generation sun care products from um, New Zealand's Aotearoa um, Taonga. And, but I will give a summary slide now. And um, that's it. This project is about developing algal-derived compounds to prevent and improve the outcomes of sunburn. And we're looking for molecules that we know about, and we're looking for sources that, um, that are available on farming systems that, we, that, that potentially can enable this. And thirdly, we're developing that bioassay. The most important slide here is the acknowledgement side. Lots of people have, con have contributed this. I'm really grateful. And I'm really grateful to Sustainable Seas for the funding and to my industry partners, Waka2 and um, SRW Labs. I am, um, to use Bren's term, a, a, a seaweed gardener. And, um, but I try really hard, and I know my colleagues around me try really hard to listen to mana whenua and to seaweed farmers. And um, hopefully, um, by, by having those kinds of dialogue and this kind of hui, we can find out what questions need to be answered and, and provide those kind of innovative insights. Thank you. <laughs>